Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hi, and welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Beautiful people, today I'm speaking with Nana Kasha, seven-time best-selling author, hypnotherapist, doctor of homeopathy. Kasha has studied with shamans, healers, and masters around the globe. Dare to Dream podcast won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, won the COV Award for Best Radio Podcast Show, Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it is high ranking under self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. The show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work, and you can join them at Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com. Remember that membership is open and I am going to be joining you. By the way, that is specifically on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Be sure to spe spell my first and last names correctly and go there and join membership. I'm so excited. Not only will you have private access to me, moi, but you will also have access to my guests now and then who will come do free Q&As with you. So join us, sign up today. I'm Debbie Dashinger, a media visibility specialist. I am a book writing coach, and I meet with you twice a month on Zoom, and we call our group Visible Visionaries. Also, I take books to a guaranteed international bestseller. I and my team do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I am a boutique publicist, so for folks who are spiritual messengers and have been in their career for a while doing well, I work and get them booked on podcasts and radio shows. If you'd like to learn how to be way more visible for your business, your being, your message, I have a gift for you because I teach you how very specifically. So go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest, Nan Akasha, is a visionary who has traveled dimensions for 36 years and embodies the Akasha, a fifth level Melchizedek master and a three-time Egyptian mystery school initiate. Do I not get the coolest guests ever? <laughs> Since living with the Maya, Nan has received eight Jaguar Vision Medicine Women initiations, and she has the uncanny ability to see right to the core of your challenge and into your spirit body. As a master light body healer, hypnotherapist, and homeopath, Nan can travel, see, sense, and move energy through time, space, and dimensions to create soul healing through all lives. She's a conduit for the magical realms and an oracle, plus the author of seven best-selling books and has hundreds of online programs. You can learn more about her at nanakasha.com. Additionally, Nan and I and other notable presenters are speaking at the sacred Glastonbury in UK in September, Portal to Ascension, Glastonbury UK conference. There will be a link for tickets so you can come hear us speak as well as the other amazing people who are going to be at this organization. It also includes tours of some of the sacred sites. So we'd love to see you there and to meet you. And with that, I welcome the amazing Nan Akasha to Dare to Dream. It's great to have you. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Thank you so much. I'm very excited. I'm very excited about everything you talk about and uh, this particular moment and the, the conference that we're going to. Really, really incredible, magical place. And that's one of my favorite things to do is to go to sacred places, temples, pyramids, groves, caves, whatever it is. And they're the best place to get the medicine, to get the uh, energies, to communicate with all the beautiful spirits we have. And then you get to, who knows what, you get to have wild and wonderful experiences. So I think anybody coming to the conference, 
is going to enjoy the speakers or the tours, but just being there mm. with a group of people who are looking deeper, you know, we're, we're interested in something beyond the tourist. Yeah, that's true. You know, even when I was booking my hotel and looking at the town, I was like, whoa, this is, this is really different. And I've been to London, England, countryside a couple of times, but yeah. never to anything like this. So yeah. I think we're all in for a treat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your bio, Nan, says something that sort of arrested my attention was yeah. you've traveled dimensions for 36 years. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the dimensions you have traveled and how? Mm, yeah. Well, it's a it's a long process. You know, what kind of what we were talking about at the beginning. So we come with an idea. It's not like, oh, here, good luck, or you know, here's a whole bunch of problems and we're just going to abandon you in a body and, and and try to figure it out, you know. It's like there's a design to yeah. who we are. And I always say we're here on a fully mm -hmm. funded mission. That means that the soul design. And now I understand because we're in the middle of this massive evolution, right? This accelerated metamorphosis. When mother nature, whatever you want to call that, takes off all the barriers and says, just go for it. Just start evolving as fast as you want. And then we're seeing cycles go faster and we're moving through cycles faster. We're hitting problems faster, but we're also resolving those and moving on to something else. And this leads to that. And that leads to this. And we're starting to get a higher vaster perspective of energy and time and space. And so the energy of time and space, the energy of what we've been, eh, I felt like when I had my first <laughs> spiritual awakening, it was literally like walking through the dark. Hello, there was no internet, you know. <laughs> I was very lucky to be in LA when it happened. So I did get to go to the Bodhi tree before mm -hmm. it closed. Um, and that was just blew my mind. And then I moved to New Mexico. So went from there. Now, you know, then it was like, my life is over. I'm a loser, you know, everything. I was going fully in the 3D, just believing the tragedy and the hard work and, you know, never being good enough, all of that. And what happens is that at some point, the pain or the, the, the desire, the calling for something different, I know I'm something different just drives you regardless of how deep you are in that thick lower states of consciousness. And it's that desire for a different state to actually exist in a different state that started to, you know, I was just like, okay, I went out, I worked hard. I did everything I was supposed to, you know, I got good grades. I started a business. It went to a million dollars the first year. And then three and a half years later, I'm closing it because the whole economy went down and everyone went bankrupt and nobody paid me. Well, that's the 3D reason that happened. <laughs> and now I read the energies and I look at this. Everybody has a story. It's a heroine's journey. It's an archetypical journey. It's full of amazing things. And if we accepted all of it, we would see how we were being led from where we are to a higher state in the best possible way. And now I look back at all the breakdowns and everything else as these huge quantum leaps. They were portals, they were doorways, they were opportunities because without wanting my daughter to die or for, you know, me to lose everything in my divorce or, you know, these kinds of things that happen to us, I now know even when I'm in them, oh, this is a big one right? We're, we're just, we're shedding everything about who we were and we're moving to a whole new state of consciousness. So I started to pursue first like meditation, actually, to be honest, the first book that I found at the Bodhi tree, it, it had a used bookstore behind it. And I walked in and just went, I didn't, I didn't want anything to do with religion. I just wanted something weird because, you know, I had done everything I was told and didn't work out. So I picked up a book and it said somebody was channeling dolphins from another planet. I didn't know what channeling meant. I had no clue. I even laughed at it and went, perfect. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it starts with all of your journey and realizing, are you the same person you were before? Will you live in a different dimension? And when you understand the scale of consciousness, we have a version in our shop people can get for free, but you can, you know, it's originally from David Hawkins. It's just a powerful biofeedback to realize 
when you're in guilt and shame and humiliation and victimhood, you are so low. You're like being underwater. You can't hear right. You can't move right. You don't, you want to feel great and then touch the sky and know the truth. And, and you can't because of the state you're in. You're literally in a dimension of very heavy energies. And they're what he calls force energies. It takes force to anything to happen. And then we add to it the spiritual desire to awaken and be able to do those things, which leads you forward. However, it's full of guilt. So the first thing I started to do was become a healer. I, I started to teach meditation because it was the only way I had a little time off from my inner judge. And then I started to, I moved to New Mexico and I started to go to places in the land, you know, Santa Fe and, and, and Galisteo and, and um, Chris Grisham and um, just going to this, these places and starting to see the aliens in the sky that you always see between Santa Fe and, and Albuquerque. And it was like, how can I be seeing aliens? How can I be seeing fairies? I was working with Linda Tellington Jones and I was sleeping in a teepee overnight on her land. Um, and I saw these, what I call fairies. They were quite tall and thin. And, um, and you are intersecting dimensions when you start to have these. Now, do you believe it or not? It's there. So the fact that you see it or you don't see it is the dependent on your frequency, right? Which is all of the things. So I learned with a Lakota Sioux shaman, we would start for two weeks building a sweat lodge. You know, we would go meet and talk to the land and talk to the trees and do ceremony to pick the branches. And and I did like 16 years with the goddess world and the reformed congregation of the goddess learning ritual and the, all of these things, the thing that they had in common, even with the Egyptian mystery schools was the connection to earth and much different than what we understand. We love earth. We want to take care of earth. We maybe, we maybe respect her as the mother, your body's made out of it. So, you know, it's the same stuff, but what it is, is, is a multidimensional being that has within, there's an inner earth and another earth from another time. And there's all the lives you've lived and all the souls that you've had. And when you have a past life regression, which just started happening when I started doing hypnosis on people, <laughs> none of us believed in past lives and everybody started going there. <laughs> And so that's your touch, right, of other dimensions. And then to me, it became much more interesting to go to sacred places and do these activations or work with these sacred tools. And sacred geometry was very important. You know, in the Egyptian mystery schools, you had to understand, right, that everything is structure. Everything is light. Everything is vibration. So I started to learn vibrational medicine that most people still haven't heard of, um, radionics. I became a, a master at the pendulum, which is not an easy task, by the way. We have somebody at the other side of the desk checking your work. <laughs> no, do it again. But it makes you perfect. So these masters, right, that come across our path that attract your energy and you go, wow, I love what you're talking about. They open those dimensions. They touch you and you, you see something, you feel something, if it's a meditation or an hour activation or a dream or however you're intersecting with those other realities and dimensions. And then as you move on your path, the truth unfolds, the next truth unfolds. And what happens is you go from being a seeker and people can do this very quickly now Seeking your truth is divination. That's the literal translation, trans um, uh, definition of divination. And so we've been told that it's illegal and that it's forbidden to have direct communication is basically what it is to any energies that are not us. We have to go through the church, or through the father or through the government or through somebody, right? So, there's barriers within you and barriers within the structure we live in that don't want you to go into other dimensions. They don't want you to have that experience on a daily basis. The Maya, where I live now, are fascinating because the ancient Maya 
were fully aware from the day they were born. They knew that they were spirit and they knew they were in a body. And when you say Maya, do you mean mm -hmm. Mayans or yeah, the Mayans? Ah, mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah. Clarity. Yeah. Yeah. I know they corrected me one day. We say Mayans, but they say, no, we are the Maya. And so, I think of Maya as a planet. I think of Maya as the word illusion. Illusion. Yes. Right? Yeah. So Maya. Or a very pretty name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but they, yeah, that was one of their, their um, philosophies, their ancient philosophies was that they lived in a body, but they were spirit and they lived that every day consciously. So every step, every different, you know, school or learning that I went through, it was opening another door and then working with clients, right? Working with students, taking them on shamanic journeys and learning to have no control, like no, not control. Yeah. No, not directing or controlling anything, being a hundred percent clear and open channel. That was what happened over time of visiting them and then craving a spiritual experience for another year or two. Right. And then having one and then craving it. And discovering along the way all the different modalities and things that I began to learn that showed me everything's vibration. And I, I didn't, I wasn't taught to believe in reincarnation or anything. So everything was like, huh, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. I don't know about that. And it was opened doors and you have doors programmed into your soul blueprint, but they will only open for you if you're at a certain vibration Mm, oh my God, that's so beautiful. You mentioned about uh, the sacred feminine, about the priestess. And one of the things you talk about is sacred feminine shaman. Can yeah. you explain what that is and how are we birthing the new sacred feminine shaman? Yes. Well, what I love about what's happening now is that everything's accelerated and we know we have to balance the masculine and the feminine. There's been too much focus on blaming the masculine or, or, you know, pitying the feminine. What shaman understand that the idea of a shaman to me, it's, it's the, the mystery school brought everything I had been learning for years together and made sense of it and gave me a structure for it. And Thoth is one of my main guides and Thoth if you read the Emerald Tablets, if you understand his teachings, I used to, he had me rewrite them. He had me sleep with it under my hand. But it, it's, he's one of the ones that you mentioned before. He talks about the angles and curves of time and space and how to travel through them and how to have the certain words, certain spells, certain, you know, protection, certain understanding uh, when you travel realms and dimensions. And so light body work to me can became my primary thing all day long, activating your light body, clearing and cleansing it, aligning with your highest soul signature frequency in this moment that gives you wherever you're moving that uh, opportunity to shed. So the concepts that a shaman uses is the multidimensionality. There is no time. There is no space. And the Mayan calendar, I actually learned, never knew anything about the Maya um, in my Egyptian mystery school. We had to learn all the sacred geometry, and then we had to embody the Mayan calendar. So we had to understand it here, but then we had to embody it because it's a code, because it's it's an understanding of cycles. All right. And then you start to read energies, right? So we call them channels now. We Everybody's medium or signs, synchronicities, symbols, you know, spirits talking to me, my higher self is talking to me. This is what to me as a shaman, the shaman that I've studied with vary by culture, um, vary by gender. And we've been taught overall, they removed holy women and made it, brutally clear that it was not allowed. And so we're breaking out of that. And we all carry a whole hell of a lot of fear. Which is hilarious when you consider that the first shamans were 2.6 billion years ago and they yeah. were women. The original women. medicine people were women. Yes. And then millennia later, men wanted to emulate what they saw the women doing. And then they learned how to transcend this realm to go into unseen realms and learned how to heal, which is beautiful. And that's yeah. why today, especially in Siberia, the male shamans dress like women. They sometimes even wear makeup, but they certainly wear their clothing. 
to mm -hmm. honor the women, the summons. If you're a true shaman, and even if you're a man and you've you've come shaman in, in the patriarchal cycle that we've been in, okay? Not men are bad, but patriarchal. Because what was taught in the conquering days was the lands that, that honored the goddess and that the man and, and woman were equal in the tribe and they were loved and revered equally was the pure understanding that the woman was the shaman. The shaman journeys, the shaman sees, the shaman goes with you, goes down your timeline. The shaman is in touch with other realms. Things aren't separate. It's a place you go. Your method is different by what country you're in. You don't eat meat in India and you do eat meat in the jungle. You know, it's it's just, it, it's a different context. I love certain ones very, very much. However, it is, there's Celtic shaman and we don't really hear that. And shamanesses and prophetesses and, um, you know, priestesses were everything divine feminine was made illegal. It wasn't just Christianity not wanting the old temples used. Okay. That's one aspect, but it was deeper than that. And it was a complete annihilation of the sacred feminine because they, the masculine couldn't own what this, what the feminine can do. The feminine can create life. It can accept death and it can destroy. It can create. It can be in every cycle at the same time. It doesn't need the masculine in the goddess culture. The eternal is the feminine and the masculine dies and is reborn. It is the father, the son, the lover, the, you know, the priest, and there's a dance of the balance. So yeah, with the erasing that it's even legal, right, to, to talk to the trees, <laughs> you know, much less channel the fairies or, you know, whatever it is. So all the sacred medicine, they, they worked very hard to erase. And what happened was the conquering cultures would come in and emasculate the men and ridicule them for being equal with their women. And they would conquer them and they would basically say, you can't beat me. You know, you're not a big man anymore, but I am, but you can beat your women. And they completely embedded their culture on these earth cultures or, you know, on the different cultures that respected that and then over time, we had all the other versions of, of it. So what we're seeing now is you can't stop it. It's arising in everyone. You're seeing the gender fluidity for a reason. And all that's different is if you're in a female body, you do have certain aspects, certain structures that make you have more intuitive aspects. It doesn't stop anybody from doing any of this. And what I love about you know, that we have had because Gaia came to me last year. We went to Greece. We went to Delphi. We went right on the temple where they killed her daughter, the, the dragon that was protecting her navel, that was protecting her sacred access, right? This is considered the navel of the world. So this is where we connect to Gaia's divine energy, which is primordial light, divine energy. And, and that that's was, exactly you said that was in Greece? Yes, in Greece, in Delphi. Okay. Um, and it was the most famous place for the Oracle. And the Oracle was, you know, daughter of Gaia and sat in the caves and there, which you can sort of go do still, <laughs> depending on the weather. And then the, um, if you read the Greek myths, right, the, the stories, the, uh, the masculine started to come into power, right, to take over. So what happened was, is Apollo, um, God came in, and killed. So Delphine is, uh, was actually the name of the Pythia, the Python, the dragon that lived in the earth there. And it was Gaia's daughter. And her job was to be the Kundalini of the earth and to guard Gaia's navel so that not just anybody could get access to this direct thing. However, you could only be an oracle if you were a woman. And the priestesses were highly revered. So the masculine came in, killed the dragon, burned her body, built his temple on top of it, and then made the, the oracle famous. And it became the wealthiest, most respected place in the world. Everyone went there. If you were wanted to wage war, if you were the king, if you were a poor person, everyone went and respected the, the oracle. So the sacred masculine initially came in 
and built a structure for the sacred feminine to be seen, to be respected. And I believe that's coming back Mm -hmm. uh, is the sacred masculine of the dragon year right now is building a structure for us. This is a green wood building dragon energy. It's full of opportunities. Yeah. So this is also the year of the dragon. It is. Which is no accident. I am, I love dragons, I have to say. And I have like a huge one over there that's white onyx. And yeah, I'm deeply into dragons. And I always, it kind of bothers me in a lot of movies and TV shows that dragons are depicted as these horrors, mm. right? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like extraterrestrials. They're also depicted as human eating, warmongers. Yes. I've yes. only known benevolent energy there. So that's not my reality. And yeah, I, I've always been very confused about why, because my experience personally of dragon energy, um, it I feel it's incredible fun, gentility, nesting ability, like super loving towards me. Mm-hmm. But I'm also very clear that its energy says to anybody outside of me, don't mess with her. Yes, that's I your will guardian. show you like, yes. like that, my wrath, my fire, I'll eat you. Yeah. So I yeah, we have that. guardian dragons. Yes, I get that. And mm-hmm. so there's a saying, brave men and women do not kill dragons. Brave men and women ride them. Yes. yes. And yes. I know you work with dragon energy and you, mm-hmm. do you also channel dragon mm-hmm. energy? Mm-hmm. <gasps> yeah. I Could you do the... some of that for us? Uh huh. Yes, 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 yes. Ooh. I. That's why I like going to sacred places. We channel the energies of the stones uh, the goddesses that the temples were to, or or the jaguar, or whatever is there, mm. and um, so yes, we work with all the sacred spirit guides that are optimal at this time. And because we're going to Avalon, we've been doing ones with a lot of the fun Merlin and Morgan Le Fay and the Lady of the Lake, and and so yes. So is there anything in particular you you're interested in? You seem to come alive with the the dragon. Oh my gosh. Oh. How can we work with your energy? That's what I'd like to know. How can we work with your energy? And what is it that you see inside of us that we are unaware of, but would be very beneficial for us to know? (laughs) Okay. I have my little dragon pin here. He sits on my stone in front of me. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> they're tickling my back okay the garden dragons want you to look for them ah, they're kind of like um, nature spirits you know there's like a tomato garden dragon I see you is this the little cute I think he's the tomato garden dragon here so Okay, so we are here in sacred space and we're going to call forth. Oh, they, they like you, Debbie. <laughs> There's one that's very long, red, almost feathered, and it keeps going like this around your back and your side. It has kind of a little Chinese dragon head and it does move like, um, like a kite almost. Yes, that's your fire dragon. So your fire dragon. So so we have fire dragon. I'm going to call on Delphine. And so everybody watching, if you want to put your hands, your palm portals, these are chakras. If you want to put them right here over your navel. And this is the year of the dragon. It's the year of your kundalini. And the balance of the sacred masculine and feminine within within all times, dimensions, and spaces, we ask for the energies that are optimal to leave my sacral, my belly, my Janisa crystal holding my kundalini, and 
Just allow whatever energy is to come out your hands. So I'm seeing also a very green, very oriental faced, you know, dragon. But again, the the body kind of goes off into a, a kite sort of flowing and they're sucking that energy right out through your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to activate an emerald sphere, an emerald sphere. So this green dragon is part of the green wood dragon energies of this year. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for being here. And is gifting a, an emerald energy. It's in a uh, hexagonal shape. And if you just now let that... So if you want to open your hands and create a little frame around your belly button with your hands, your fingers like this, and allow that energy to come right into that navel. We call on Gaia and Delphine, the divine daughters, and we ask that our umbilical cord be reconnected back to Gaia down we call Delphine, the sacred kundalini daughter of Gaia. Please come to us and open the doorway to our sacred soul crystal. Thank you. Thank you. Just allow that to go down in there. And know that you're in a sacred temple of light that I create before we begin. And everything is aligned to what is optimal for your highest good at this time. So you can relax and receive, receive, receive. So the B, they want to say the B, the B, the B, the B, the B. They like the B, 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 I, B, I, B, I, B, B. The best way to utilize what is within you is to receive it, to accept that it is there, whether you know it or not, to go deeper. And this is a foundation that cannot be shaken. So you know you are a sacred woman and you've walked many paths of sacred medicines and wisdom and there's many ancestors on the path here. And this path is one that requires the fire and requires the earth. These do not normally play well together. So the wood of the earth. What can you build with your creativity? What is within you needs expression. It needs to find a way out. It needs to say, this is the moment. Let's bring the seed into the sun. Let's find the optimal environment. Let's bring a beautiful crystal sphere. And you work with the dragons every day. We, we like to play with you as you walk in your house. And many of you are like this. You know, we are like a cat around your feet. We like to go in between the feet and to rub on you. Because most of the time you're not aware. So we mm, give your aura a brushing, maybe. Mm, yes. And this is the time now to say there is something within me. This is a brilliant question. This is exactly what we want you to ask. Because this, as you have said, as you have spoken, this is a year of opportunities you haven't imagined and doorways that will open to dimensions that you've never been in, and yet you are very familiar. And so... Is it the fire you need? Or is it the earth? Is it the renewal or the acceptance or perhaps even the death? To really discover, to illuminate what is within you, the death must happen. Always you must go to the very bottom and you take that sacred breath and you sink. And this is where you know it is only you. 
And this is where you remember that it is only you. And only you means everything you need, everything you are ready. Ready what? Ready. What are you ready for? Standing, moving, breathing, sleeping, listening, laying, moving, more fluid, fluid, fluid. The earth, she's speaking to you every day. The earth dragons are in the roots. And they are bringing this beautiful green energy that must be like a um, vitamin, like a vitamin. It is a mystical, yes, I would say elixir, no. Hmm, okay. Code, it looks like a green mist to me. But the word they want is a code. And when it feeds you, then it's like part of you can say, I'm ready to leave that, to shed the seed. The pod isn't needed anymore. This is also a very important call from your ancestors. What is it that you agreed to? What is the promise that you had to your soul? Because this promise is what is most vital. It is what you call vitality. It brings the junction point where the vital energy of life and the vital decisions, the vital creation of your decision to be here now, to be the conduit now, to be the one that travels time and knows the past, and the one that travels and understands the goddess, and the one that travels and understands the child, and the one that travels and understands the man. All is holy within you. The ancestors know now that the soul lineages are calling. This is a gathering of a different kind of tribe. It is a rainbow tribe, but it is also your tribes, the ones of wisdom. You know them and walk on them. So each day, listen, listen. In stillness, listen deeper and the water dragons most important of all they are the guardians of the codes of the crystals in your fluid the blood and all the fluids these hold very important codes Talk to them, bless the waters of the body. Now, the sacred serpent says, Shed, you are already everything you've ever imagined or is required in this moment. If you shed now, you will reveal it. How do you shed? You walk through, you keep walking through. The fog, the fire, the fear, you walk through the uncertainty. You even walk through the joy. And then the other side calls. Stillness. The mists are thinning. And this is the dragon here. You have this all around you. All around you. Take a deep breath in and hold it. Is it fire? Is it water? Is it mist? Is it ice? Is it crystals? 
what is the essence, the earth magic that the dragons are gifting you right into your heart center and then accept it and let the breath go within as you release it. Taking the medicine into the cells, speaking a special language. The shamanic language of the divine feminine is alive in the earth, in the lines, the currents, and the spirals and the vortexes. And these are alive in you. We bring you this and you take it and receive it. And you will soon see that you are sacred waters in a form. And those sacred waters will water the path. And it will be a path of great beauty. Let it grow within you. Be sacred. Remember the path of the shaman. The path of the shamaness. The path of the priest. The path of the priestess. The path of the mother, the teacher, or the lover, all of it is a choice that can be walked in balance, and you have everything you need within you to read the signs of destiny. Now the question is, will you listen? We have a great owl here looking. This is the owl of Athena. I am here to see the truth and will see through the lies. Do not fear your paths, step forward. You are greatly anticipated and greatly loved. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We give great thanks to these divine energies and to this opportunity. May this circle be open yet unbroken and this beauty go with us in our hearts, breath, words, and step, and so it is. Mm. So it is. Mm. Thank you, that was so beautiful, so beautiful. And we had a few guests here, I just wanted you to know. So this is Albatrax. This is my white onyx dragon. Oh my goodness me. He's very heavy, but he sat through that whole thing and he was completely with you. I'm madly in love with him. Yeah. <laughs> and so Albatrax had a baby and <laughs> he's also very heavy. So this is the egg that the baby came in and then it broke open. And this is Albatrax's baby. Oh my God. It's a, so it's a baby dragon. And oh my gosh, I love it. He lives Look right there because he has to, you know. He, I he think is, that's who I was seeing first because it was a little, a little, the little garden dragons, the, you know, and, and it was like this little, oh my gosh, he's so cute. Right? <laughs> and he, he has lessons every day with Albatrax. And so <laughs> they were all here. For that, oh, we were very excited about everything you were saying and doing, and they were thanking you for the beauty that you mm -hmm. guided us in there. That was really very calming and a gorgeous transmission. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know, Nan, that you also do. You mentioned earlier this uh, dolphin communication and animal communication do you have <clears throat> like the wildest story an experience that you had in communication or in reality 
with mm. a dolphin. Yes. Well, in a dolphin, um, wow, there's so many years I've had, uh, well, I went on a wild dolphin swim when I was pregnant with my daughter, Jordan, who later passed. And so we had that, um, earlier on, but in the last eight and a half years, since I moved here to the Yucatan, I met a, a healer who had a dolphin center and I was able to go do healing work with the dolphins, with the paraplegics, um, do my energy work. And, uh, and I'm a seer. So I would tell them what I was seeing or what the dolphins were asking for. Uh, the trainer would bring the dolphin over to her and pointed at different places. And then I started doing my retreats where we go in and we meditate with the dolphins and we do heart to heart weaving with them and third eye activations with them. And, and, um, and I get to see the energies and communicate with them. So I've gotten to know many of them very well. They're beautiful, loved, beautiful, beautiful, loved, very beautiful, called for this as part of their mission. They wanted to touch people. They wanted to, even if someone comes just, you know, as a, uh, a fun day with their family, they touch those people and they say, now what we can make a difference. We're a grid. Now we can have this power and we can bring this influence into lifting them up as you guys are going through your transformation. So, um, <clears throat> but the first one, first thing that came to my mind was early in my, um, spiritual awakening, I moved to New Mexico. I started working with Linda Tellington Jones, who is a, a healer, uh, had a particular energy healing method, started to work with animal healer and radionics lady from France. And then I went to the zoo and I became a docent. So I did four months of behind the scene working with all the different animals. No one would let me pet a cat, but oh, well, <laughs> they'll eat you. No, they won't. Uh, so, uh, and then I would go and I would walk the alpacas and, you know, be at the zoo uh, once a week. So I was leaving. They had beautiful white tigers. It's a gorgeous zoo, by the way, huge, beautiful. The white tigers were down there and they had waterfalls and, you know, it was a very beautiful place. But I was still in the stage of my awakening where I felt guilty. I felt bad for all the animals. And I'm not saying you <laughs> to allow uh, animal abuse. However, what we think uh, is quite profound. And so I was learning all these different concepts and energy and I was there looking at them and wishing I was down there kissing their noses and and I was just feeling so conflicted I felt this love and then I felt this pity and I felt this sadness and how horrible we are and the whole story of our evil evil humans and they just what? that was my first super clear animal communication just jumped right in my head and just went cut it out would you stop it I think it's what they said would you stop that please and essentially told me very, very clearly, they said, you sending us all that pity energy doesn't help us. It doesn't help anyone. If you see someone as a victim and you see them as a victim and you pity them and you think that it's not that you don't do anything if you feel that it is your path to do something. However, you're stealing the respect for a sovereign being. They said, we know what we're doing. We have a mission. We're here for a reason. Okay. And yes, thank you for your love, but just send us the love. Don't send us the love mixed up with all those low states, I call them now. And it was so profound uh, that it made me have to go very, 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 very deep in my spiritual journey to get to there's no right or wrong, which is a whole can of worms we don't have time for. However, when you get to a certain place and you start to go to these other dimensions and you walk like in multiple dimensions all day long, I'm speaking to all of these energies. My coconut trees are guardians and they're alive and everywhere I'm going, I'm asking permission to the earth. It's just become normal, right? To walk like this. Um, and it's, it's these kinds of things. So it's not that we don't help. If it, you feel called to help abused women, please do that. However, hating people who abuse women doesn't help anything. Seeing them as a victim doesn't help them. Stepping in and seeing what they need, how or do you have something to give, or stay away and see them as a kick-ass, powerful priestess, shaman, woman who came into this life to complete a whole lot of shit, which is what we're doing. We're here to complete a whole lot of 
ideas and mindsets and relationships and karmic vows and all of that stuff in this life. And right now we are supposed to be wrapping it up because we're in unity consciousness. So what the dolphins say is that you need to play. You need to play, you need to play, you need to play. And they will, uh, they weave between us when we're doing our meditation. And when I look afterwards at the energies, I can see that they're working together. Like one's over here sending energies to the, the head. And this one's over here catching those energies as it comes out the feet and then sending it back. And they're sort of flossing or they're doing different things. But they say that you have to unravel too. Um, at a recent retreat, I had a lady come to two retreats, uh, one in December and again in March, and they were so pleased to see her. And they kept saying, we're so pleased because now we can take you to the next step. We can't jump you from where you are to there. And they live in the oceans and they're very aware of their multidimensionality. And so they're here to bring a balanced woven grid like energy to the waters, which then speaks to our bodies as well. So it's very much about play because they're masters. They're masters. They have sex all the time. They play all the time. They are they they never sleep. They have two giant brains, <laughs> one sleeps at a time. So um, yeah, and and that's their bottom line is always: Would you learn to play? Because that means you're going to rise above acceptance, where you transcend all the judgment. Right, mm -hmm. you go into harmony. You go into the st the higher states where you can start to because joy and happiness and bliss those are those are master states. So if you were happy and you were playing and you weren't seeing yourself as a victim and you weren't treating yourself like a victim and you weren't bringing carrying around all those thoughts that we were all given that you're never good enough, right? Instead, this brings you back into the present moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's, we have just time for a little bit here at the end. I, I do want to talk about Avalon a little bit. And is Avalon connected to awakening magical powers? And if so, what practices or what rituals do you recommend for people who want to tap into their own innate magical abilities? Yes, yes, yes. So Avalon is the um, the ancient name for Glastonbury or the Tor. Um, so like all conquering cultures, they put their structure on top of the same sacred site. Everybody knew the sacred site. They didn't show up and say, oh, those people didn't know what they were doing. They built Stonehenge here. There's obviously nothing going on. You know, the pyramids, whatever, right? They showed up. So, that, you know, as we can see around the world, the Christians came in and they put their church on top <laughs> of everything, right? Of all the sacred goddess things. Uh, but there was a time when the mists, right? The veil was much thinner that... We, we lived and walked in that respect with goddess, with the earth, with the sacred magic, with that understanding that the dragons are real um, and that the fae are very real. In fact, they have some skeletons. So um, I've got a lady coming on my retreat who's going to be sharing about that. And so we've got these realms that make your life way more interesting. You don't have to wait until you're perfect or you find the right man or you get all the money or whatever else you thought. You can tap into your divine magic, your truth. And that going a place like Avalon or Glastonbury, you're naturally, I mean, every it's kind of like the way the dolphins would say, just bring them here. You know, we'll do our thing. I think that the land just calls you there because they have sacred waters. They have, these waters come from Gaia. They come from inside the Tor. And the Tor was the Isle of Avalon. And so the understanding, it's 1212, and I just keep seeing it. It keeps jumping in my face. Um, the Isle, Isle of Avalon is the representative of the divine feminine. Now, we don't live in a world of only masculine. You have to have both to have anything in form. However, we have a very out of balanced one, right? And so the idea that, we have magic within us was forbidden. We have direct access to Gaia, to the fairies, to this stone healing me, you know, to uh, the wisdom of my body being able to tell me what it needs instead of running for a pill to suppress its voice. You know, the, the understanding that we have the senses, we have the intuitive senses, we have the receptors. We are already naturally built for communication and we're already manifesting our reality. No one else is. 
So we're already these incredible masters waking up and remembering that. So the beautiful thing about the divine feminine is that we get to play. We get to get let go of having to be defensive about loving fairies or wanting to wear a fairy ring or having a baby dragon. You know, we get to play in the imagination of it. And this is where creativity comes. Our wombs have been hijacked literally, physically and mentally, emotionally, the sacral as this as the place for divine creation. And so Avalon is so magical. The more that um, the more that I've investigated there, the more that I've uh, found, you know, magic women that are going to help us make fairy wands in all the sacred places. We're going to be going, you know, private. You can go into the White Spring or to the Chalice Well. And these are the waters that come directly out of this aisle. And there used to be water around it. They, they know, you know, the, even the scientists agree. Yes, there was water around that that hill. And the, the key though was, is that even when all this time that gathers our imagination, you know, further back the Druids, but the real goddess culture and, you know, all the, the King Arthur and all the, the beautiful things, the chalice, the Holy Grail, the quest, it's all about the quest for your divine feminine. The chalice is the feminine. It's a request for that reclaiming your ability to create your own. And my thing, uh, my strongest suggestion is that if you feel called to it, you know, read about it, you know, get, uh, there's, there's so many beautiful pictures. Like we have images of different, you know, Merlin and these different people, you know, that we're, we're, we're making, but water. Okay. One of my favorite magic to, to do is water magic. And water magic is all waters are connected. All waters talk to each other. He, all, they can be ocean waters or still waters in the earth. They could be waters that come from uh, the, the sky. Those are yang waters. And those are what we drink. But it's the sacred waters that Gaia produces in her womb that produce spirals of energy in the earth that is called sacred water or yin energy. And this is healing energy where if you go over energies that are more the yang energies, they can be disturbing. They can actually cause different diseases for people. So speak to water, work with water. Put I have I put out jars for the full moon recently. There's some full moon water right here, somewhere here, <laughs> right here. Um, and talk to the water. When you get in the shower, talk to the water. Ask for the waters of Avalon to come. Ask for the magic that you were to come. Use waters to purify, use waters to rejuvenate. You know, you can program your waters. You could, um, you know, tune in uh, and call into Morgan Le Fay, call into the fairy realm, call into the lady of the lake. These are all divine feminine archetypes that you have within you. And you most likely had lives there then or in other places. I had many Celtic lives. I am Celtic, actually, this body too. Um, but I didn't even know I had Mayan lives until I came here eight years ago. So there's many, many, I, I feel like our soul lineages are calling and our past lives or whatever you want to call them, our other lives, the ones of those magic, the one, those ones of those powers. So you could vary. Everybody relates to Merlin. It seems to be even, you know, uh, that divine energy that's okay to have you know, because he survived sort of like Mother Mary survived, you know, all of that, you know, no other women allowed, but Mother Mary was like the only little icon that sort of made it through the dark, you know, and Merlin was the only wizard or magic person that was like, well, that's okay. You know, <laughs> there's a little bit of that archetype that holds for us. So you call on those energies, look at some pictures that people have posted recently when the Aurora Borealis was happening behind the tour. Mm -hmm. yeah wow yeah. yeah that is so beautiful thank you for that i do shamanic full moon rituals every month and new moon rituals uh, because of the age i am every month shamanically yeah. and i never considered including water i mean our rituals are gorgeous as they are but mama mia to add the water is so smart. And then you have that aspect to carry with you forward to put on your yeah. altar 
or whatever, you know, somewhere in your house so that you can keep working with it and create magic with it. Because in our new moon or full moon ritual, we're releasing things always, burning them in the fire. We are uh, aware of our intention of what we are about to create and desire to create. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we bury that into Mama Gaia because right as a seed, the sun will shine, the water will come on it to bring uh, etheric sprouts, the sun will come down to let it shine, the wind will come to blow the fruit, the seeds further and allow our dreams to go to lands we would never conceive of. Yes. And then this water that you're talking about. So, so were- bring the water to walk to plant, especially in the new moon, right? If you're planting seeds, literally, especially, or, and then remember, you can also take some water and you can use it to release. You said you were releasing, like release into that water, let the water take that energy from you. All right. And then pour that water into Gaia in some sacred way, you know, so that you have another level of that, of that release too. Yeah. I always have some on my altar. I have it there, but I live on the beach. So I have a lot of shells. Um, It's fun for altars to, to get a shell that you can, um, you know, put some water in and you can just, you know, have it on your altar in a shell too. Shell magic is quite powerful too. We'll have to talk about that another time. Yes. Oh my goodness. I thank you so much. That was great. So Nan Akasha, how can people besides your website, nanakasha.com, get a hold of you? Or where where is your good stuff? Where's my good stuff? Uh, shop.nanakasha.com is our shop. And you can get everything from the main website too. And I have a very active YouTube channel. And it's uh, youtube.com slash joyful nan. Um, and um, Facebook, the same thing, joyful nan. Look for me everywhere, joyful nan. I think it's the same on uh, Instagram too. And um, yeah, and and really come and check out because I like live experiences. So we do this shamanic work and this channeling here in the Mayan land. We go in the caves. We had in March, we did eight rebirthing ceremonies in the cenotes. We went down into the waters. We had different shamanic healers coming. <laughs> we went into, the last one was this gong rebirth bath. Oh my goodness. And then I spent a month processing that. So, but it's 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 so wonderful to to see everybody waking up. And I want to thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you're doing and who you are and the wonderful path you're on and and for spreading this message. It's really important, really important. And everybody here, remember you're here for a reason. And even though we're moving into individual spiritual expression, we are one and we have a new way of understanding those two separate best life. And you are so important to this path. It's not like, well, I'm not good enough. No more. Stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up in your power. <laughs> and Nan, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future Ooh, dreams and goals? Fantastic. Wow. Well, I have everything that I want and need right now. I live on the beach with my soulmate and um, my children are happy. My parents are 90 years old and still alive. So the the path for me this year is to really follow the dragon and because it's building Um, I had a much bigger business than the four years ago. My partner had a huge seizure, Kundalini awakening, and he's finally back now to functioning about four hours a day. And I can, I can do things and travel and we love to travel. So we're going to be a month in England. Uh, One of the things we're doing is, is the portal to Ascension and we're planning already more retreats there. Um, We're going to be going to Avebury for the rare lunar alignment and to Greece. And I want to keep going to all the sacred places and finding all the sacred women and men, the sisters and brothers that are waking up that want to walk this path. Because to me, doing everything in a sacred way is the most important. So yeah. Mm, Beautiful. And again, I'm glad she brought this up. Nan and I and many other amazing presenters are going to be speaking and touring in September at the Portal to Ascension Glastonbury UK Conference. If you would like to join us, you must register. And folks, it's coming up. So you want to do that so you can get your plane ticket, your hotel, or your Airbnb, whatever you're going to do. And the ticket 
will be in the show notes. So be sure to check it out there for Ascension Glastonbury. And I end this show today with this quote from Ursula K. Le Guin. For fantasy is true, of course. It isn't factual, but it is true. Children know that. Adults know it too. And that is precisely why many of them are afraid of fantasy. They know that its truth challenges, even threatens all that is false, all that is phony, unnecessary, and trivial in the life they have let themselves be forced into living. They are afraid of dragons because they are afraid of freedom. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, your weekly Dare to Dream podcast. Leave a comment and share. Next week on the show will be the amazing Elizabeth April. Yes, she's back. She's a clairvoyant, intuitive psychic, and a best-selling author. Elizabeth is a galactic channel, and she talks about cosmic disclosure. Thank you for joining us today on Dare to Dream. And remember, the dragon who looks after you, who loves you, and is there to protect you. Create all your dreams into your Reality. Thanks for joining us today.